You are watching something that no one has ever seen before. The first live images from the bottom of the ocean, from the final resting place of history's most legendary ship, Titanic. When HMS Titanic set sail on her maiden voyage, she was the largest moving object on Earth. A testament to the achievements of sophisticated engineering. But at 11 p.m. on April the 4th, 1912, a glancing blow with an iceberg brought her brief moment of glory to a rapid end. One thousand five hundred and twenty-three people perished in the freezing waters. Also lost on that night was our unquestioning faith in the promise of technology. Eighty-six years later, we're now piecing together what happened in Titanic's final hour. Over the past two weeks, a team of explorers and scientists have been involved in a perilous expedition, sending probes further into the wreck than they've ever been before. The team are battling against the same natural forces that destroyed Titanic on that fateful night. I'm Bob McEwen, and welcome aboard Ocean Voyager here in the middle of the North Atlantic. In fact, at the very spot where Titanic sank back in 1912. You and we will be part of an extraordinary expedition that has brought together scientists and historians some of the most sophisticated undersea technology in the world and the people who operate it. And all to help us better understand what exactly happened to Titanic on that fateful night 86 years ago. But the Ocean Voyager isn't alone out here. It's one ship in a flotilla of four. And somewhere else on the water in a ship called the Abay Supporter is my colleague Sarah James. Hi, Sarah. Hi, Bob. The Abay is a research vessel, but its duty on this mission is to provide a temporary home for a treasure which eluded this team back in 1996, a treasure which has co-expedition leaders George Tullock and P.H. Nargile, very happy men. It is called the Big Piece, and it is the largest piece of the Titanic ever to be brought to the surface since the ship sank. As you can see behind me, microbiologists and other experts are already busy studying the Big Piece, and we will bring those stories to you. In addition, there's another vessel that's part of the fleet. This one, two and a half miles down. It is the French mini sub Nautil. And the images you are seeing are unprecedented. The first live images from inside their inner space capsule. And we will be speaking to them a little bit later on. But for now, we want to return you to our intrepid robotic explorer Magellan for more of those live pictures. Basically, Magellan is an unmanned submersible connected to this ship, the Ocean Voyager, by a two and a half mile long cable. There's a control room downstairs from us here where the pilots, they don't like to be called drivers, they're pilots of Magellan do their work. And basically, they can, as you'll see, fly Magellan up, over, and around Titanic to provide the kind of spectacular pictures that uh, we've already seen and we'll see many, many more of. As those pictures come across our monitors today, I'll be joined by Charles Haas, who's an historian, and the man who knows as much as Titanic, of Titanic as anyone else. Charlie, you've been down twice. You've dived twice to the wreck. That's right. In either of those trips, have you seen the kind of vivid pictures we're seeing tonight? Well, of course, the human eye adds the dimension of 3D, but when you're looking through Nautil's porthole, which is only perhaps five inches across, 
uh, you really have a very narrow view. So this is really the, the widescreen epic version of Titanic, and it's very spectacular. Having been there, give us a guided tour of what we're seeing right now. Okay, right now we are actually coming up the, uh, the forward mast of the ship, uh, and this is really where Titanic's drama begins on the night of April 14th and 15th, 1912. The lookouts actually entered the mast down below and climbed a ladder inside the mast up to the crow's nest itself. And as we can see on the monitor there, uh, that is the hatchway through which they entered the crow's nest. That would be a tight squeeze from what I can see here. It really was. Uh, the mast is only about three feet across, and um, they, they worked a, a long shift in very cold weather that night. Uh, and about 11.40 p.m., uh, lookout Frederick Fleet and his uh, mate Reginald Lee were thinking that the, uh, the watch was going to end uneventfully when uh, they spotted something in the distance, and it turned out to be a, a towering iceberg. And uh, Fleet imme immediately sounded the crow's nest bell and telephoned the bridge, perhaps using that wire down at the base of the uh, opening there. Uh, that may very well have been the wire into which he plugged his uh, portable telephone. And uh, if we look very closely, I think you can actually see the steps of the handholds inside the, uh, the mast there where the men had climbed up earlier in the evening. So the, the, the warning is telephoned to the bridge, and for the next 37 seconds, uh, Fleet and Lee watch and wait as the iceberg draws closer to Titanic's sign. The beginning of the story that brought us here tonight. I think if there's one thing that everyone has learned so far, it's that when you're working in the middle of the ocean, there's nothing that is easy. You're in water. It may be one of the most complex peacetime operations of all time. Ten months of planning, a flotilla of ships. Almost a hundred experts from a dozen different countries. The most advanced deep sea and communications technologies on the planet. What makes it so difficult is it's in the Atlantic Ocean, 500 miles from the Newfoundland coast. The dive plan is arduous and dangerous. It's coordinated from two ships, Nadir and the Ocean Voyager. They're fixed by the global positioning system directly over the Titanic wreck. Nadir supports the manned submersible Nautil. A short distance away, the Ocean Voyager launches the remote operated vehicle, or ROV, called Magellan. The link between these images and the rest of the world is a five-mile cable which carries video through 13,000 feet of water back to Ocean Voyager. With this setup, the expedition has started to explore the wreck in far greater detail than any previous effort. The wreck and the debris that surrounds it covers an area equivalent to about 15 football fields. Already the investigation is producing a welter of new images. But the investigation is fraught with dangers. Well, it's very difficult because we're pulling together more platforms, more ships than has generally ever been done for an oceanographic expedition. If one of the cables was to be severed by titanic wreckage, it could spell disaster. Wait. This is especially so for the manned submersible Nautil. This tiny submarine, designed and built by the French, can dive to depths greater than almost any other submarine in the world, including military submarines. Nautil is lowered using a crane. As many as three people can squeeze into the cramped seven-foot interior for the two-hour journey, during which it descends two and a half miles to the wreck site. Only four inches of titanium protect those inside from the crushing pressure of the sea. The minutest of cracks in its hull, and Nautil would immediately implode. If the tether of the ROV broke, it could fall down and fall across the man submersible or go through the, the thrusters and, and disable it, and then they would be stuck on the bottom. Half a mile's boat ride from Nadir, the Ocean Voyager operates as a command center for the ROV Magellan. Built in 1991 and weighing about three tons, Magellan is the workhorse of the expedition. Damn. It takes four people to steer her. Manipulate her arms and operate her cameras. What are we looking at there, Bruce? The first images that Magellan captures are haunting. Everyday objects 
scattered for miles around the wreck. Ron Schmidt is the senior ROV pilot. It just produces a, a thrill that um, similar, I would guess, would be walking on the moon. Operating the ROV is a highly you're skilled job. To the mothership. If you sever the umbilical cord, you're in trouble. Can you tell me some depth, please? Uh, 2,300 meters. With so many links in the chain, there's great scope for error. But the investigators feel well prepared. We're taking a big risk, but we've tried to put together a crack team, and everybody's an expert in their own systems, and we'll hopefully keep everything running. And happily right now, ROV Magellan is up and running, or more precisely, two and a half miles down and running. As you tour around the bow section with Magellan, every now and then there's a glimpse of the mundane realities of life as they must have exi existed on Titanic until 11.40 p.m. on the, the night of April the 14th. Charlie Haas is with me. Charlie, describe what that is. Where uh, Magellan is actually hovering over the starboard side of the boat deck, and we are looking down into the bathroom of Captain Edward J. Smith. And as we go in closer, we can actually see the, the plumbing fixtures, the shower head there, and uh, a tub that's very badly in need of a cleaning, I think. Uh, Captain Smith was the senior commander of the White Star Line. Uh, he had more than 30 years of service with the company. Uh, he was 62 years old, and there was some indication that he was planning to retire after this voyage. Now, a lot of the responsibility for what happened that night has been placed by some on the shoulders of Captain Smith. Do you think that is fair? I think he was basically the one that was caught with his hand in the cookie jar. He was following the, the procedures that every commander of the North Atlantic followed. Go at full speed until such time as your lookout told you there was a problem, and then take evasive action. And in his case, that wasn't enough to save his ship. And it was supposed to be his final crossing. Very, uh, retirement that's, voyage. That's what we believe, yes. Yeah. These shots from Magellan of Captain Smith's room and his, his bathtub. There's much more to come from the ocean voyager as we continue with Titanic Live. I am standing is two and a half miles above a remarkable site which you are able to see right now. Images from the French mini-sub Nautil. These are the first images from a manned sub, and Nautil is gracefully flying over the stern of the Titanic. And what we're about to do now has never been done. I'm going to talk, I hope, to Paul Mathias, who is down in Nautil and who is exploring the wreck site. Paul Mathias, can you hear me? Yes, sir. We've... Uh managed to come down here uh, two and a half miles beneath the sea surface and uh, we're uh, very very remote from all the things that are going on up there right now uh, it's uh, very otherworldly it's a really different uh, different planet different environment can you show us paul the various cameras that you have aboard nautil maybe you could just whip us through the images that you're seeing there yeah sure uh sarah the the first one that you're looking at is uh, our camera uh, that's controlled, uh, uh, it's fixed on the outside of the front of Nautil. Uh, the second camera is uh, our pan and tilt. The third is the view of the ROV. Um, and the fourth, of course, is the uh, inside camera. You were one of the key people who exploded a myth about the Titanic, the myth that it was a gash of an iceberg that broke it down. Can you tell us quickly about what you determined happened to Titanic? Well, the popular myth has been that uh, the iceberg cut a 300-foot-long gash in the side of uh, Titanic. And uh, in 96, we had a chance to come out with uh, some imaging equipment and detect the openings uh, that were caused by the iceberg in the bow. Uh, in actuality, what we found were uh, six separate slits, and uh, uh, the total area of those slits was something less than uh, 15 square feet. This is the actual uh, level, if you will, where the iceberg uh, really did its damage. Uh, we found in 1996 that it, rather than a, a huge, gaping 300-foot hole, as had been pictured in many 1912 publications 
It was actually a, a very small series of stabs, uh, just six in number, uh, totaling about 12 square feet. And what we're seeing here is the, the actual uh, level of where some of those stabs took place, down at the, uh, the sand line, as it's called, about uh, 14 feet above the keel. One of the truly remarkable things I think about Titanic is that after 86 years with all the analysis and the books and the movies about this most famous of ships, there are still mysteries, still unanswered questions. And it is looking for the resolutions to those questions that I think brings members of the expedition like Charlie Haas back to the North Atlantic again this year. During the 1998 expedition, the team of experts exploring Titanic are tackling a new mystery. Recent evidence shows it wasn't a single large gash that sank Titanic, but rather a series of wounds, often as thin as a finger. In their search for more evidence, the team are plotting a route along Titanic's exterior to look for signs of iceberg damage. You have to see that far. Basically what you're looking for is, even though the decks have been compressed, closer to each other with a break or the stress. The investigators will employ the ROV Magellan along the starboard side near a massive hole in Titanic's hull. At the wreck site, Magellan works its way along the mud line, which is concealing most of the wound in Titanic's side. As it manoeuvres around, Magellan's cameras capture a startling image. They're showing a great interest in this hole here. This small separation in the hull is thought to have been the first photograph ever of the fatal iceberg damage. The 1998 investigators are also focusing on Titanic's rivets, which may have failed, contributing to the disaster. This massive piece of the ship's hull retrieved just days ago could help us to better understand the role of those rivets. We hope uh, to learn from the rivet story that uh, maybe how the sinking sequence actually started. I don't know whether it's corrosion or working or... Notice the trend in those that we have analyzed and they seem to tell us the story that these rivets may have actually failed. The 1998 investigators also want to know much more about how and why Titanic's massive hull shattered on such calm seas. Okay, bring up hydraulics and lights. Using Magellan, they scour a large area littered with pieces of the Titanic, known as the debris field. Hidden somewhere in this rubble are clues to the ship's destruction. The debris field is spread out across the ocean floor between the bow and the stern. Light objects such as pipes and plates are found farther from the wreck. Heavy objects on the other hand, like boilers, are found clustered close to the stern. Just the right this pattern side. suggests that Titanic may have burst apart close to the ocean bottom. If, if the ship had broken at the surface, you would expect the boilers, and if the boilers fell out, you'd expect them to be fairly widely separated. At the rear end of the bow, the ROV drivers guide Magellan on a dangerous search for boilers inside Titanic. Peering through the wreckage, the team identifies five intact boilers. Five for five. This contradicts survivors who testified to hearing the boilers explode and crash through the ship. It gives us an indication that probably all 24 boilers that were in operation didn't explode and didn't leave their foundations. And after the, the bowl is... The investigators also want to know if Titanic's watertight hold exploded inwards, causing enormous destruction. The main question was, what happened to the vessel once she went below the waves? How did she become in the condition that she's now in? And especially in the after end, why is the after end so badly broken up? The images Magellan sends to the surface are astounding. Titanic steel plates, one inch thick, have been crumpled like paper. Yeah, it is. It's incredible. The forces are involved here. I think you can see the torture this ship went through when it sank. It's, uh, the steel plate is 
twist it in all the different shapes and forms. Incredulous, incredulous forces involved in this sinking process. Much of which we don't understand yet. And two of the people you've just met, naval architects David Livingstone and Bill Garski, are with us again on the 1998 Titanic expedition. Gentlemen, have you seen anything so far out here in the North Atlantic this time that would explain those tremendous forces that created such damage on the stern and at the separation between the bow and stern? I think we've seen uh, a tearing apart of plates. The big piece is a, a good example of what we have seen the forces that are involved here that rip the plates apart, pull rivets out of the plate, bearing failures, almost anything you can think of in terms of failure for in the big piece. Would you agree, David? That's quite right. Uh, and uh, it's extremely interesting that there's practically every mode of failure that you can imagine. It's, uh, it's not a single failure, it's not a single type of failure. Uh, it, I think it illustrates that the, the, the system was very well balanced, uh, that lots of things failed, not just one or two things. Well, what would explain rivets failing and steel failing? Again, huge forces on the surface. Uh, the vessel probably started to crack uh, because of the, the bending moment when the stern rose out of the water, the bending moment was a magnitude uh, greater than uh, what the ship was ever designed to take. And, well, then, and then, of course, the extreme pressures uh, on a hull that uh, was, was filled with air. And it would simply implode with very violently, uh, probably at, at something more than 100 meters. More damage from the bow section of Titanic as seen by the ROV Magellan. If getting down to Titanic is dangerous, getting inside Titanic is even more dangerous than that. And for all the wonderful things we've seen them do tonight, Nautil at 18 tons and Magellan at almost three tons are simply too big and too valuable to risk on the narrow hallways and mangled inner spaces of Titanic. And that is where Nautil's sidekick, a submersible called Robin, comes in. Beautiful, this spectacular imagery. When Nautil turns on her lights, a spectacular sight is revealed. Gliding over the bow anchor, she makes her way down the starboard bow, then maneuvers over to the side of the ship and approaches the officers' quarters, where Captain Smith and the rest of the commanders slept. The expansion joint. Huh? That's the wireless cabin. That looks like even looks like a piece of equipment in there. Nortil dispatches little Robin, and the ROV drops down the opening to a place few have seen. This is where Captain Smith went just after midnight to tell wireless operators Jack Phillips and Harold Bride to call for help where Phillips tapped out in Morse code more than two dozen distress calls, both men manning their posts until they heard the water gushing in. We've got you good photography of the Marconi transmitter and we have the geometry of Morse A tuning apparatus once embedded in the side of a wall. It's just a small part of the then modern Marconi system, which could reach other ships and land stations more than 500 miles away. Just behind the wireless room, the grand staircase. Robin will use the stairwell to visit cabin B-54, the best room on board. She enters through the destroyed glass dome at the top of the staircase, and passes the remains of an ornate pillar, once gleaming polished oak. You see the heater there on the right side? That box. 
A gold-plated and crystal chandelier still hangs above the grand staircase, where one could make an entrance like Colonel Astor or Molly Brown. Robin's topside camera observes the raised wood panelling of a B-deck reception room. It included the most elaborate accommodations, like suite B-51, booked by the wife and son of millionaire James Warburton Cartes. Here one could pay a courtesy call to Titanic creator Bruce Ismay in cabin 54. His wash basin in the corner is slowly collapsing. Nearby, one of Ismay's high-backed chairs tipped over on its side. Penetrating the cabin further, Robin discovers what's left of the door, its knob still in place. Robin's mothership, Nortil, then heads for the bunker hatch, where she'll send her ROV down several decks to explore the mail room. In the hatch, Robin passes these safety bars. On the other side, a third-class recreation room. Robin makes her way down to G-deck, where the mail sits. There she sees a crumpled sorting table, then an accordion-like gate used to cordon off another section. Next, a truly odd sight. Piles of canvas mail bags covered by what looks like pink shag carpeting, a life form yet to be identified. Teal has been traversing the enclosed promenade deck, her lights bouncing off first-class cabin windows still intact. Nortil then returns to the officers' quarters, where she photographs Captain Smith's bathtub. Something like a table. Yeah, you see? Oh my Something gosh. like a table. I'll be blind. Look at that. Look at that. Well, that is, that's, that's incredible. Charlie House, you've been cheating. You've been you've been watching the feed direct from the ROV Magellan, and you're ahead of us. That's where our next sight is. What I is sure that? am. Uh, what we're doing now, Magellan is hovering over the skylight of the Marconi room, which, as you can see, was located just behind the uh, first funnel. And it it is interesting because this room, in a way, is both the cause and also the salvation of the disaster. What do you mean? The cause, from the standpoint that uh, two very important ice warnings that came into this room were never taken to the bridge because the two radio operators were so busy with backed up traffic that they didn't have the time to take it up to the captain. And the salvation from the standpoint that these men stayed at their post until almost the very last minute sending out the distress messages that finally did bring aid. Yeah. Was one of those distress messages in fact the first SOS as has been said? It's actually one of the first. There was actually a, a coastal ship off the uh, American coast that, that sent the first SOS I believe in 1908 or 1909. But uh, Titanic is among the first. And luckily, she had a very powerful radio apparatus, uh, one of the most powerful on the North Atlantic, so that certainly made a difference in terms of reception of those distress messages. Charlie, take us into the pictures you've been watching before us. This is a, an actual part of that Marconi apparatus. Uh, we're still trying to determine exactly what part it is, but it apparently is a, a bunch of wires coming together in some sort of a, a junction box, uh, possibly a, a means of varying the resistance of the, uh, the uh, cables up to the antenna. 
And uh, I think this, this shot really demonstrates very nicely that with Magellan you can get up really very, very close and, and almost with a magnifying glass it's, inspect it. It's magical, isn't it? You know, Sarah James, I've got a bunch of grizzled Titanic veterans here who are just enraptured with the uh, images coming back from Magellan. I would imagine it's something the same over on a bay with what you're getting back from Nautil. That's exactly right. Everyone here is looking at the monitors, trying to get a glimpse of just what's happening with Nautil. And in fact, we're going to try to go back down to Paul Mathias if we can. Paul, can you hear me? There he is. Paul, can you hear me? Yes, yeah, Sarah. Uh, we're trying to uh, very carefully maneuver our way uh, uh, out of the, uh, the engine room area here. We're going to be going around to the side uh, uh, of the stern section here shortly uh, as soon as Paul, Robin returns. Paul, can I interrupt returns. you for just a second? I'm interrupting sure, you ahead. because I want to ask if you can show us your outside cameras. Can you switch over to no to uh, Notil's camera or Robin's camera so we see what you see? Okay, there's uh, Robin's camera uh, at the moment, uh, backing away from uh, one of the pumps near the engine. Uh, and this is our outside camera. You can see right now it's just looking at uh, the cable going out to, uh, to Robin. Uh, Robin uh, has come out from, uh, uh, is now moving over towards uh, another part of the engine here. Uh, we're looking at, uh, looks like some original paint as well. Well, Paul Mathias, we're going to allow you to continue your underwater odyssey with Natiel, and we will continue with our odyssey on Titanic. we look at those extraordinary images, what I'd like to do first is to dial back into our long distance connection to the bottom of the ocean to Paul Mathias, who's two and a half miles below. Paul, you still there? Paul, can you hear us? Yeah, hi Sarah, how's it going? It's going very well. We were looking at some fantastic pictures just outside your porthole. Where are you on the stern right now, Paul? Well, we're right near one of the uh, uh, thousand-ton engines down here, and uh, we're work working our way through the uh, uh, the stern. We're getting inside the stern, uh, underneath uh, some big overhangs, and uh, it's uh, it's uh, really quite a complex, really ki quite a uh, destroyed uh, part of the ship. Paul, at this point, I'm going to bring in two other voices that'll be very familiar to you. P.H. Narjale, who spent more time on the wreck than anybody else, including Captain Smith, and George Selleck, who has also made several trips down to the wreck site. George, let me start with you, if I can. Those engines that he's talking about, how big are they? Well, they're four and a half stories, 45 feet high. They're the largest piston engines ever made by man before or since and they weigh a thousand tons each. Uh, they're just the biggest piston engines with an eight-foot piston. It's incredible. PH, what we are also looking at is that Nautil, and maybe, Paul, you can show us this. I don't know if you can. Nautil is on a tether. That makes this a lot more dangerous. Can you tell me why? Yeah, because if this rope is going in the propeller, one of the uh, propeller of the thruster or the main propeller of the, of the Nautil, the Nautil will be attached on the bottom, and, and if you cannot cut it, it will be a nightmare for the, the Nautil. And in fact, that's what we can see right there, that white light. What is that white light? The white light is the light of the Nautil. Right. George, you've been down to this site many times. Yeah. People don't know very much about the stern. What's your theory about what happened to cause that extraordinary damage? Well, I think that, that the stern did not want to follow the bow down because it had water and buoyancy in it. And by being forced down, it took tremendous implosion. And on the way down, this tremendous force of the ocean capturing that air pocket just did a tremendously uh, implosive force on all this steel. Paul, if we can return to you for a moment, can you describe for us where you are right now? It looks like a kind of a tangle of pipes. Where are you? Yeah, we're, uh, sorry, we're right next to the, uh, the starboard engine right now. This is one of the pumps and uh, uh, we're looking at uh, something that doesn't really look uh, like it's been down here for over 85 years. It's got just a thin film of dust on it. Uh, 
we're going to uh, try to uh, move closer to it and have a, a, a closer look, but uh, in the background you can see uh, a lot of the rust and uh, a lot of rust overgrowing the, uh, uh, the rest of these giant engines. We should also point out, Paul, it's not exactly uh, warm and cozy down there, is it? Well, it's not, Sarah, and it's getting uh, getting colder by the minute. We're inside of a seven-foot sphere, and uh, you can see, uh, I think back here, the uh, condensation is starting to build up. Uh, that's because it's, uh, it's about uh, 32 degrees Fahrenheit on the outside. In here right now, it's about uh, 45 or 50 degrees, uh, getting colder all the time. We're going to talk to you now about something else that's been a huge part of this expedition. This has been the dream of P.H. Nargile and George Tullock. It is finding and recovering just a piece of Titanic and bringing it to the surface. And now, on this mission, they have finally been able to reclaim this piece from the deep. This is the big piece, a large section of Titanic's hull. Ever since Titanic was discovered in 1985, investigators have tried to recover the piece in an effort to capture some of the ship's history. Naval architect David Livingston is not usually given to such flights of fancy, but his company, Harland & Wolfe of Belfast, built the Titanic, and he's long wanted a piece of her back. Referring to original architectural drawings, Livingston discovered that the big piece came from a first-class cabin on Titanic's sea deck starboard side. For George Tullock, Titanic 98 is unfinished business. In 1996, he almost got the piece to the surface, but a sudden storm forced him to let it drop back down to the deep. Now he's back in the North Atlantic with a team of French oceanographers. Team engineer Pierre Valdive will try once again to raise the big piece using his ingenious lift bag method. This time, five enormous bags, each filled with 6,000 gallons of lightweight diesel fuel. Each bag is capable of bringing three and a half tons to the surface. On the French naval vessel Nadir, the five bags are tied to enormous chains, then dropped to the ocean floor. Then Nortiel goes to the bottom to carry those chains and lift bags over to the big piece. David Livingston goes down in Nortiel to watch history. He's in the sub as it makes sure all the lines to the chains are cut. Voila. The lift bags are free and the big piece should start to rise. But on Nadir's bridge, the news is not good. Computers show the big piece isn't rising. The piece is stuck too deeply in the ocean floor. The new plan is to add another lift bag for more pull. There will now be seven tons of thrust tugging at the hull. Everyone waits anxiously on Nadir. Suddenly, computers show the lift bags are beginning to rise. A chain surfaces. Okay, enough, enough, enough. But Tullock stops the hoist ropes. Divers make a dangerous plunge through lift bags and lift lines and come upon the big piece, still in one piece. We got him, let's go! On the surface, the hoisting begins again, and slowly, the piece breaks through the surface and into the sunlight for the first time in 86 years. Livingston is on another ship. He couldn't make it over to this one. At this moment, Tullock wishes his friend were here. Livingston should be here. David Livingston should have been here. Men on dinghies move in to strap the big piece so it doesn't swing wildly on the deck. One slam into that A-frame and the brittle steel would shatter. The hoisting starts for a third time. The tension is nearly too much for Tullock. I can't take this, you know. It's completely out of the water now and swinging toward the deck. Where's the rope? Where's the rope? Why isn't this rope tight? Now, okay. The long end of the piece is giving the crew problems. 
and as it's finally laid onto the deck, the long end bends up dramatically, just stopping short of breaking. For the team, it is a stunning victory over the North Atlantic. And David Livingstone? He sees the piece next day. I think it really had to be brought up again. It had to be recovered. And one of the questions being looked at during this expedition by scientists is exactly how long Titanic will survive in the form we're seeing tonight for future images to be sent back to us of this sort. That's a question that Sarah James has been examining. She's here now. Thanks, Bob. Yes, as a matter of fact, it's something scientists will be able to learn more about from studying the big piece, this largest section of Titanic that's been brought to the surface. With me now is Dr. Roy Cullimore, a microbiologist. And Dr. Cullimore, if you could tell me first, what are rusticles? Rusticles are like rusty concrete, but they're very, very porous and they are alive. And they're growing because there are a whole bunch of different types of bacteria and molds all growing together to make a very elegant and complicated home. When we look at the rusticles here, we see that they are all heading in one direction. Why is that? That's because they're trying to get to the food first. The food is in the water flowing towards them. And so the rusticle that wins is the one who gets to the water first. The same thing happens in a water well when there are rusticles growing down there. And it's going to be through studying those rusticles that Dr. Cullimore will be able to tell us many more details about the fate of the wreck. Rats first get out of my way. On the ocean floor where Titanic rests, there's a rich variety of life, even at the pressures found two and a half miles deep. It takes four inches of titanium to protect Nortil and her passengers, yet only a thin shell protects this crab, adapted to its own environment. And that particular environment is selected which organisms will grow there, whereas the environment up here is obviously selected that we are a species that can grow up here. Roy Cullimore has studied a wide range of the marine life around Titanic. But it's these eerie stalagmite-like structures called rusticles that he finds most interesting. The rusticles are the dominant uh, organisms on the Titanic. And it happens that that extreme environment is a suitable one for these microorganisms and they are able to extract the iron out of the Titanic. I don't know Rusticles are the waste products of anaerobic bacteria which devour the iron from Titanic's hull. They are destroying the wreck. When you look at the Titanic today from the 1996 expedition, I would say that the Rusticles are removing 0.1 of a ton of iron from the steel every day. And so it's only going to be the matter of possibly 90 years before the Titanic biologically implodes, collapses into itself, and eventually simply becomes an iron ore deposit on the floor of the ocean. The great ship, once considered a symbol of technological triumph, will ultimately be destroyed by Earth's tiniest creatures. It means that time is running out for those investigating Titanic. What is it? For this expedition, Dr. Cullimore will test several types of metals to see which the rusticles prefer. He's built a platform with various steels for the rusticles to dine on. We've got a really tough steel. We've got a very strong steel. We have a mild steel. We have steels that have been twisted and bent and tempered and burnt and hammered. And what we want to do is see whether the way that we treated the steel affects the way the rusticles first ran onto the steel. After months of preparation, Dr. Cullimore is ready. He's back in Nortil for the two-hour descent to the ocean floor. After several unsuccessful attempts, Dr. Cullimore's platform of steel is now affixed to Titanic's engine room. It'll stay here for at least a year until he returns to check on how much further damage the rusticles have done. Hectic, tiring. The stern section is... Uh, 
powerful mess and uh, never realized just how bad, how destructive the forces of nature have been. There's a little bit of color. During his dive, Dr. Cullimore was able to compare the extent of the rusticle damage to his previous dive in 1996. He found the rusticles had grown significantly in just two years, and their growth will hasten over time. Cullimore hopes that his rusticle traps may enable ships to be built with hulls that will last longer. What I hope we can learn is, number one, is there a way to produce even better steels? that are less likely to biologically deteriorate. So the tragedy of the Titanic can be turned into a modern day treasure of knowledge. And for an example of exactly what those rusticles are doing, we take you live back down two and a half miles where Magellan's cameras are showing you the rusticles growing on the expansion joints. This is the deck below the promenade deck and you can get an idea of just how much damage they are doing to Titanic. Indeed, everyone here tells us that the damage just in the last two years is incredible. And I know, Bob, you've been joined by a panel of experts there, too. What are the thoughts there? Well, these people, I think, Sarah, know Titanic as well and intimately and sentimentally as anyone there is. Gentlemen, I'd like to ask you, coming out here year after year to pay your respects, as you have on previous expeditions, when you see the sort of thing we've seen tonight, does it occur to you that sooner or later, probably sooner, you'll have to say goodbye to Titanic for the last time? Yes, it's uh, quite obvious that the decay that uh, I have seen over the last two years has, has been really tremendous. And it's really sad to see how quickly uh, the ship is disappearing and dissolving. If you came back in two years, David, and you're a naval architect, how much more of this would you expect to see? Well, I think we must expect the, uh, uh, the decay to accelerate. Uh, at what rate, uh, we don't really know, but perhaps uh, Do Dr. Cullimore, his uh, r research will tell us uh, a lot more about that. Yeah, Bill Garski, what about you? Well, one thing I, I got out of this expedition was that the, uh, the 300 foot gash is certainly a myth, and that the ship started to break apart at the surface and uh, try to really comprehend the forces that were involved in the final moments of a grand old lady who now, perhaps with maybe, I, I'm talking with Roy Colomar, in about four years will start to show advancing decay with the deck starting to collapse and the sides starting to fall in. Yeah, and it's sure. rather sad. Charlie House, you think it's possible that many of these Titanic mysteries, the unanswered questions that brought you back expedition after expedition will cease to be an issue after a few more years. I think the Titanic is going to live on, but in an altered way. I, I think we're, we're moving beyond the, the physical wreck uh, to the point where the ship is, is mainly existing in our memories. And I think that's one reason why the recovery of the artifacts is so important, because as, as time moves on, those are going to be the only tangible reminders we have of what was once a very beautiful and wonderful ship. Gentlemen, thank you all very much for being part of this magical evening out here in the middle of the North Atlantic. Sir, I don't know about you, but there are a couple of things which will stay with me for a long time after the weeks we've spent out here. Just the respect of all the people who've worked on this expedition. They're the top of their profession, they're the top of their craft. They've come out here in some cases to risk their lives to show us the pictures we've seen tonight. But at the base of it all was an enduring respect for this ship and the passengers and crew who sailed and died on it. Searching for the Star of Bethlehem, snogging under the mistletoe and studying at Santa School. We're opening the Christmas files for some festive Fortean TV fun.
There are stories so powerful, they grip the world in an electric spell of fascination. It's got a head! For nearly a century, the story of the Titanic disaster has mesmerized us all. Let's stretch your legs. Tonight, follow director James Cameron on his quest to find a human drama more powerful.